Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. After Jesus has entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and in Luke's gospel in particular, he has kicked out the money changers and calls the temple a den of thieves. And unsurprisingly, perhaps, Luke twice informs us that the chief priests, the scribes, and the most important men in the city are actively looking to destroy him. Right before this parable, the chief priests and the scribes had asked Jesus, by whose authority are you doing these things? Now, these things that they're referring to meant overturning money tables. It meant condemning the temple and boldly preaching judgment against the establishment from within the temple itself. And Jesus replies, look, I'll answer your question about authority and legitimacy if you'll answer my question on the same topic. Was John baptizing people from heaven or from man? Well, Jesus, if you haven't got the point yet, had made powerful enemies when he called the temple and its leadership a den of robbers. Uh, Jesus' words condemned the, the temple's setup and its leadership as illegitimate. And the chief priests are the ones in charge of the temple. Now, again, it seems like it's easy to confuse chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees. Today we're talking about the, the chief priests in particular. And the chief priests are the ones who are in charge of the temple. Now, they are not nearly as hung up on a theology or as the scriptures as the Pharisees were. In fact, they probably don't care very much about Jesus' theology, but businessmen hate losing business, and the power-hungry defend their power doggedly. So they ask a question of Jesus that, that's kind of really maybe better represented in English in two questions. First is, just who do you think you are, and what do you think you're doing? After all, uh, they, the chief priests, are the ones who Rome has put in charge of the temple. It's legally under their protection and under their organization. And they were the ones who ran it and were in charge of it. And the temple was big business. So if Jesus publicly declares that he has the authority to direct the temple's business, well, he's kind of saying that the chief priests don't have that authority. Uh, but that's a problem, because if Jesus claimed to be in charge of the temple, it would undermine Rome's authority, because the temple was probably uh, the most important bargaining chip and, and status symbol in Jerusalem for Roman and Jewish relations. Rome allowed the, the Jews to use it, but Rome believed and acted as if they were in charge of it, like everything else in the empire. In fact, there was a, a Roman, Roman symbols on the top of the temple that Herod had built or, or uh, renovated. Then um, these Romans had put the chief priests, men who they had selected, who were more to Rome's liking, in charge of it. Um, now, throwing over a few tables like Jesus did is maybe small beans from Rome's perspective, but a publicly claiming to be the real temple authority well, that's less than one step away from open rebellion. And that's why the chief priests try to chap, trap Jesus with this question. You see, the chief priests assume Jesus will say that he has authority over the temple because to the Jews, it's obvious that's what Jesus is doing. He's acting like he has authority. And Jesus has shown no fear or regard for what uh, the authorities or powers expect and so the, the chief priests probably expect Jesus to state the obvious. Jesus claims to have a higher authority than the chief priests. And then if they get him to say that publicly, that's uh, speaking against Rome's authority, which probably means Rome would be uh, care enough to intervene. But Jesus evades directly answering their question. Uh, plus, the, the chief priests 
well, they end up losing face because they're forced to, to admit publicly that they are being duplicitous. They ask very tough questions, but they refuse to answer any tough questions out of fear. And the reason I include all that is because it really is the background, which our gospel lesson uh, that we selected reading does not include to set up the parable of the wicked tenants. Um, at first blush, it may look like Jesus doesn't really answer their question at all. Who do you think you are and just what do you think you're doing? But the parable of the wicked tenants is his answer. And although he doesn't directly answer, everyone present, we can read from the Gospels, understands what he means. Jesus' parable starts with a man who plants a vineyard and rents it out to some farmers. Now, when the time came for the rent to be paid, which obviously the owner deserved because he owns the land, he's let them use it, they, uh, they refused to pay. He sends a servant to collect, but instead of paying the rent, the renters beat up the servant, and another, and another. So the owner sends the most important representative, his son and heir. But as they see the son approaching the renter's plot, if we kill the son, we will have all the land to ourselves. And so they do. But Right? It's all over for the renters. They might get to enjoy their profits without paying for a few more days or maybe even a, a few weeks, but as soon as the owner gets all his ducks in a row, you know what he will do. He will not stand for his own son being killed. He will come and he will destroy them and he will give their vineyard to another. Well, Luke tells this tells us the crowds knew Jesus was not simply telling a story. They say, when he comes to the conclusion of the story, they say, surely not, uh, when obviously that's what would obviously happen. Uh, but they understand that something more is being said. Um, he was, Jesus was condemning Jerusalem's leadership. He's included the scribes and the chief priests in, in a sweeping claim about Israel's failure to be obedient. God had sent them many people, many prophets, but they had beat up the prophets and not listened to them. Jerusalem had often rejected prophets, just like John the Baptist ha they had, but now these men were taking it a step further. Jesus is prophesying that the power and authority of the wicked chief priests and scribes will now be taken away from them and given to another. Well, the chief priests and the scribes, we read, are furious about this. And they wanted to grab Jesus then and there, but they couldn't because the crowds wouldn't have allowed it. Uh, the chief priests and scribes are outraged because their petty, greedy, and selfish nature has been publicly exposed. They pretend to do what is right or lawful in God's eyes, but, but in reality, they seek to attack and destroy the servants of Yahweh. Uh, because just like the farmers in the story, that Jerusalem's leaders were not interested in obedience. Right? They, the servant says, pay the master, and the, the son comes and says, uh, is obviously the, the right one uh, to receive rent, which is basic if you're renting from someone. Uh, and the, in the agricultural world, and you would, in the ancient world, you would pay once the crop came in. Well, Jerusalem's leaders are not interested in obedience. They're only interested in opportunity. The chief priests, for, interest, for, for instance, seek to leverage their control over the temple to gain power and money. Uh, the Pharisees are a little different. The Pharisees use their position and knowledge of the scripture to gain control over people's lives. For both these groups, religion, God's word, it's just a tool for them to get what they want. And that's a warning for you and me today. And that's not to use uh, religion or God's word or a savior as a tool simply to get what we want. Jesus adopts a different sort of attitude, an attitude of obedience to the Father. 
Now, Jesus refused to be a puppet of worldly powers. I mean, just in this story alone, he's uncooperative and condemns uh, some of these worldly powers. He's uncooperative and disobedient to the Sanhedrin, to Pilate, and to Herod, uh, and even his own apostles in the crowd. He doesn't do just whatever anybody tells him. He is no puppet. But Jesus is obedient to the will of God, his Father. When his Father sends him into the world, he goes as a humble infant. He follows the Holy Spirit's leading into the wilderness to suffer, fast, and face temptation. He repeatedly tells the apostles the plan for him is to be rejected, suffer, and killed. Later, he'll go with the soldiers, and, and he makes it clear why he's going to fulfill uh, the plan. He condemns himself later before the Sanhedrin, and he won't defend himself before Pilate. Why? Because he's following the plan of the Father, and he seeks to rescue us. As he said at the end of our gospel lesson, when he looked directly at the crowds, and he said, well, what do you think it means when it says the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone uh, because Christ was the, the stone the builders rejected, and yet God has used this for your and my salvation, for our forgiveness. Um, Jesus has rescued us, and now we have been freed to follow his example. Don't don't follow the example of the chief priests and the scribes. Don't use God's gifts or the scriptures to try to make yourselves richer or more respectable or more attractive in some way. Don't take your opinion and gussy it up by quoting a Bible passage taken out of context. Don't use God's laws as an excuse to be nasty to others. Don't use God's grace to excuse your commitment to something wicked. Rather, follow the example of Jesus, because we are called to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and follow Christ our Lord. Take on the radically different attitude that Jesus demonstrates, that life, it turns out, is not about opportunity. Life is about obedience to the Father. Life is not an opportunity to make my life better. Life is not an opportunity to experience it all or make a big splash. Life is an opportunity to be loyal to the Lord. Because once we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, once we have experienced God's kingdom and the gospel, we realize that there's nothing better than it. Life is an opportunity to be faithful to the Father. Because we've tried everything else in the course of our life. We've tried rebelling. We've tried doing it our own way. And most of us have experienced how futile and bankrupt that way of living is. If you want it to be all about you, you probably won't like the invitation to follow Christ. But the reality is that slavery itself is as isolating as anything. And you cannot free yourself from it. But Christ has freed us from ourselves. Our Lord gives us the best reason of all to be loyal to him. He doesn't just demand blind obedience. No, he loves us. In fact, we love because he first loved us. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and laid down his life for us. Because he is our Lord and God. He is worthy of our obedience. But he's not just our ruler. Rather, he is the Lord who laid down his life for you, as we just sung about in that beautiful hymn. He's not asking us to take the first step. He's already taken the first step of faith, giving up his life. Giving, Jesus gave up his life in the hopes that your heart would be reached and transformed by his love. This is why Jesus gives us this invitation. Lay down your lives Repent of your sins and follow the call of Christ. Don't look at your life as merely an opportunity to get your way or get stuff or pleasures or experiences. Rather, look at life as an opportunity to be obedient to the Lord of all. 
because Jesus has promised that he will remake and redeem this broken world, starting with our own hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen.